And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, the afternoon session of the 60 by 25 conference. And this is the session, Student Academic Achievement and COVID, how far our students are behind and how can we catch them up? Uh, my name is Sam Nelson. I'm with the Illinois Student Assistance Commission. Um, and so on behalf of all the other network organizers, thanks for being part of our session this afternoon. Um, today's session is a very timely um, session that probably touches upon all of us on this meeting in some way, whether you have students yourself um, that are experiencing um, the impact of COVID on their learning, you're a student yourself. It isn't just high school and elementary students that are experiencing this, or you work at some organization um, to support students. So um, we'll be talking a lot and really seeing what the data is showing us so far. And to help us do that, I'm very glad to introduce our two speakers, uh, Sean Bergman, uh, Dr. Bergman is the co-founder and research director at the Vela Institute, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to increasing educational outcomes. Uh, Sean is also the Kulninich Klein uh, Distinguished Professor of Psychology and the co-founder and current area research director of the Center for Analytic Research and Education and the founder and co-director of the HR Science Research Team at Appalachian State University. So Sean um, is in North Carolina. That's where he's driving in from, zooming in from. And then also with him is Austin um, Melzer. And Austin is um, a um, graduate student at Appalachian State University uh, working um, in on his master's in um, industrial organizational psychology and human resources management. And then he's also working with the Vela Institute in their investigation of the learning impact brought on by COVID-19. So just a little bit of background though, um, how ISAC is in working with Vela Institute is that Illinois at ISAC, we administer the Illinois Gear Up grant, um, which is gaining early awareness and readiness for undergraduate programs. And Vela is um, technically our um, evaluator for the Gear Up grant, but there's so much more. Um, and it was actually after one of our 60 by 25 conferences in 2019, where Sean was our keynote speaker talking about the importance of uh, data in our work. And as a result of that conference, we created a new initiative called Evidence-Based Practices, which we'll talk more about. But again, it's been a great partnership that keeps growing, um, not just with ISAC, but with our communities around the state. So with that, Sean, I'll turn it over to you and I will be giving you the co-host powers. Outstanding, thank you, Sam. So Sam covered a, a lot of uh, good information there. And so you can see here on the slides, uh, that's a little bit about who we are, and, and I don't know if there's a, a whole heck of a lot of need to, to reiterate uh, the, the introductions there, so I appreciate you uh, giving us such a, a warm introduction there, Sam. Uh, what I would like to do is uh, go over um, uh, some of the logistics of our session just to get everybody kind of prepared about what we're doing and, and where we're going to go. Um, specifically, uh, talk a little bit about how we want to use the chat feature. Uh, we are hoping this to be a very, very interactive session. And so uh, feel free to throw stuff in the chat. Um, Austin or and or I uh, and potentially Sam and Jasmine will also be kind of manning the chat, if you will, uh, and, and discussing in there and throwing out there. So if you uh, see anything that resonates with you, um, please, please, please uh, throw those into the chat. Um, also, if you have questions, uh, we'll be looking to, um, to uh, you know, answer those throughout the session. We do have a Q&A session there at the end, uh, but we're going to be actively engaged in the chat. And so you'll see that chat box uh, flashing quite a bit when Austin is doing the presenting, because I uh, like to be in there and, and, and add notes and, and throw some information out there. Uh, but it's supposed to be a two-way street. Uh, finally, um, for those of you who have not used um, uh, uh, Zoom too much before, I insert the joke here. Uh, if you're not familiar, at the very, very bottom of the screen is your chat function. So if you push that button up, uh, you can chat with other individuals. There's also a reactions button there. Um, and so Jasmine, you'll be happy to know that uh, I now have additional uh, emojis uh, on, my, um, on my screen here. Um, so Jasmine is the absolute queen of emojis during our, our meetings. Uh, and I am often very, very jealous uh, about the emoji stuff. So um, having those emojis is also a way to interact with us to make sure uh, that you're uh, enjoying what we're doing. Just to make sure everybody's not asleep after your uh, lunch. Why don't we do the, uh, give me a thumbs up or a clap uh, there in the emoji button uh, and just uh, and see what's uh, okay, good. Uh, Michelle, Hillary, James, Nick, thanks. Lenore, thanks. Michael, Celia, Carrie, Linda, Kathy, David, Lexa. Nice, great, thank you so much. 
Uh, and finally, we are going to use, utilize the breakout feature room, uh, which means we're going to put you in rooms of somewhere between two and three other people and ask you a couple questions. The questions are going to be really, really simple. It's just more of, uh, since we're not getting an opportunity to come together and during a lot of our virtual sessions, folks miss that opportunity to chat with other people and make some network and, and make some networking happen and, and make some connections. So we're going to simply ask you a question about, hey, what have we already discussed about the learning impact of COVID that resonated with you? What are you all seeing? Give you guys an opportunity to chat five, 10 minutes in a smaller group uh, with, uh, with one another and then come back and report out to the group. So that's coming. Just wanted to give you a heads up. And then again, we'll have a Q&A there at the very, very end. Um, and so just uh, those are the overall logistics and session uh, pieces that we want to cover. Um, Sam did actually a really nice job of giving us an overview of the 60 by 25 Vela and gear up relationships. We'll talk a little bit about EBP, and then we're going to give you a review. This will be Austin's part of a review of the previous research, talk to you a little about the project data uh, that we've examined and some of the results, and then talk a little bit more about remediation, remediation strategies, and then kick you into Q&A and networking. So with all of that, Austin, let's go ahead and kick over to the next slide here. Uh, so as Sam already talked about, uh, this was a little bit about the, the 60 by 25 gear up L, uh, L, uh, Vela relationship. I just really want to highlight that a lot of the work that we're doing uh, is around professional development and this thing we call evidence-based practices, and that is making better decisions using a whole host of different sources of information. And so we have started this process working with a lot of different gear up schools with the overall intention of raising those schools and raising those communities into the 60 by 25 network. And so we started this process, as Sam said, a little bit about over a year, over two years ago, about a year and a half ago after the 60 by, 60 by 25 conference in 2019. And going to the evidence-based practices framework allows you to identify a number of different issues that you would like to use evidence and improve your decision-making around, and then find interventions to help your communities, help your organizations, and help your schools. Austin, if you go to the next slide, the evidence-based practices framework essentially says that you make your best decisions when you consider information from five different sources. And so those five different sources are represented in the center of the graphic. They're also on the left-hand side of your screen. And that is, if you take a look at the scientific literature, the research that's already been done, uh, many, many times uh, folks have already looked at a very similar situation to an issue you're examining and have done some work on it. And so we take a look, so we're not reinventing the wheel. Uh, then we look at your organizational information, your organizational data to see how well those uh, situations and those, those, uh, those, 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 those circumstances that has been in the scientific literature apply to your exact uh, organization. Then we also ask for your professional expertise. Y'all know these communities, you know these students, you know these organizations. And so while it's really great to have other people's and outside perspective from the data and the research and the literature uh, infusing into that decision-making process, we absolutely could, uh, make sure that we have that information in there. And then we go through a fairly extensive process of identifying and determining who should be involved at the table, how, who should be uh, uh, informed about what's going on, and where your different stakeholders should be in this particular process. And of course, all of this comes together and communicated out via technology. So we go through the seven phases um, of the um, process there on the right hand side of the screen and around the outside. I'm not going to bore you with all of those particular details, but uh, we went through this process and identified a number of different issues uh, that uh, uh, five different schools within the gear up community uh, wanted to hone on and focus on. And so we were off and running, uh, answering some questions, providing uh, 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 evidence based interventions, uh, support to implement those interventions and to help the students in those schools out. And then next slide, Austin, COVID hit. So originally our plan was with this particular uh, school is we were gonna help them effectively use a new computer lab that they had built and installed uh, in their school. And so there was a lot of research on the most effective ways to use computer labs. And we had gone out, done all that research, we had collected the data and we were getting ready to implement uh, that particular solution. At the same time, we were gonna help them uh, more effectively do a K through 12 uh, integrated curriculum. And there's several ways that you can implement those and, and, and do that curriculum and have that be the most effective and most efficient for your students. And we were working through that process with them. And then we decided, you know what, with nobody being in school and the uh, hybrid pieces and some of the other stuff, the uh, computer lab was not the most pressing need with the, um, uh, the, the COVID kind of pieces going on there, the curriculum and that integration was gonna be pushed back a little bit. So we turned our attention to this learning impact 
uh, with, with COVID. And so that's one of the things that's really awesome that I really enjoy about this evidence-based practices framework. It's the framework I use and I teach whenever we talk about how to use data and analytics to improve your decision making. We don't just focus on the data and analytics. We focus on all the different sources of information and how you in integrate all those pieces of information together. And so we turned the evidence-based practices focus on COVID learning impact. And so with that, we brought Austin on board to help us do a little bit of the literature about what the COVID learning impact, the kind of the causes of it, what we can expect. And so Austin's gonna talk a little bit about that. I'm gonna come back and talk a little bit about the remediation strategies after we throw you in a breakout group. And then we're going to show you some of our preliminary data and tell you a little bit about where we're going with our Gear Up partners that were working on a COVID learning impact study. So without further ado, Austin. Thank you for that great introduction, Sean. And as we've talked about, and has, as he sort of set up this uh, framework for evidence-based practices, when we were looking at the COVID impact, we really identified three sort of major areas that are going to be impactful for in terms of students and their academic impact. And those are summer learning loss, absences, and this virtual learning component that was kind of brought out by COVID. And so the first kind of major avenue and way we can look about the look at the impact of COVID is this summer learning loss. And so you may have heard this uh, be called summer slide and summer setback. And uh, it's, it's really a simple kind of concept. It's really just that as students take time off during the summer, they're going to slowly sort of lose information. And that's because they're not really focused on learning anymore. They're focused on other things like recreational activities and such and having fun during the summer. And so slowly over the summer, students are losing information that they've gained and researchers have identified this or likened this to a faucet, like a leaky faucet, just slowly sort of dripping information away that they previously learned in the uh, school year before. And so overall, these studies have really come together and though they vary a little bit depending on the age group and certain scenarios and different factors, estimated losses from the summer are usually centered around one month of learning from the previous year. And so overall, however, with COVID, we expect these to be greater because just simply the time amount, the time spent over the summer has been greater. Students uh, left school earlier in the spring and then came back earlier or came back later in the fall. And so generally they're gonna have more time off, which leads to more of that dripping effect and more of that information that they have previously gained being lost. And of particular concern for this is the effect on different student groups. And so students of certain backgrounds might have different uh, opportunities during summer. And so one of these things may be um, access to books at home. Maybe parents have an extensive list of books that students can read or they have easy access to a library, whereas, whereas other students really don't have that. And so there is kind of a scenario brought by COVID where you might see um, differences in the levels of achievement that students are able to get or the levels of students, level of impact that COVID is having on students during the summer because of these differences in scenarios. And particularly some of the literature suggests that these summer losses may be greater in reading particularly because of those things, like I said, where some students may have access to more um, literature or information as they kind of just read over the summer for fun. The second major kind of avenue for the research on the impact of COVID is absences. And again, this is a pretty simple concept to make. As a student is absent from class more, they're spending less time with the learning material, and then their academic performance is going to suffer as a result. And some of the information from the literature on this is that it's more or less a linear relationship. And so those effects of the absences stack. So every time you get another absence, you're losing a little bit more academic performance. And in particular, some of the research focuses around chronic absenteeism, around 10 to 15 absences per year, where a student has really gotten those noticeable differences. They're noticeably behind their other students. And so another really important consideration and factor coming from the literature on this is that absences have an effect on the whole class, not just the student that was absent. And this, uh, the researchers have sort of suggested that this is because teachers kind of have to slow down a bit to make sure everybody's staying on track and making sure that everybody is being taken care of. So the whole system of the classroom is slowing down a little bit to make sure those students that missed are catching up. And so in terms of the COVID actual impact on this, 
it's been pretty bad. So COVID health concerns, obviously, and also the switch to the virtual classroom has really led to increased absences. So before the pandemic, um, a study from Education Week had shown that it was about, students averaged about 6% of days absent prior to the pandemic. And now after COVID, it's around 10%, um, approaching 12% in virtual only classes. And so obviously this is a real major concern and it's led to a huge increase in absences. And that's really an impact of COVID that we're fearing because of these increased absences. So then the last major consideration for COVID would be virtual learning. And so I wanted to start by pointing out that virtual or online learning isn't inherently bad or significantly significantly inferior to like a traditional in-person learning. Um, and there's actually a lot of good research out there that says if you're doing online learning right, then it can be just as effective. But the issue is that schools really just weren't ready for this. I'm sure plenty of you can really attest to this fact that as teachers, you weren't ready to shift to online, students weren't ready to shift to online. And that's where the real issue is coming from. And so students are used to that social activity in class, they're used to kind of working with their peers, and that's sort of a fun component of school. And that's kind of decreased for them. And also, students aren't as used to kind of regulating their own work, or their work pace, they're used to having a teacher kind of making sure that they have a schedule for the day and they're on track, whereas some of that has been lost. And then same thing, an issue for the teachers is that they're not as able to kind of monitor their students. Um, Sean and I actually co-teach an undergraduate course, and I know I've run into this in the virtual learning environment where it's really hard to gauge how your students are doing. It's hard to tell if they have a question and just sort of all of those visual or social cues that you would get in person are more difficult to pick up on in virtual learning. And so collectively, virtual learning has provided an issue, especially for COVID and that access to technology. And I'm sure we've all heard about it. Um, students might just simply not have the internet access, not have the devices that they need. Um, I see from the chat, not logging in, not turning it on the camera, that engagement's much harder to get. And so it's not just that, but it's also just the, the kind of area that you have for online learning. If you're forced to do it at home, not everybody has an office or a space where they actually have enough time. Like I would love an office, but I'm in the corner of my bedroom in like a rental home because um, that's just how it is. And it's easier when you have that classroom space to just sort of have that class built out. And so overall virtual learning can also kind of impact different students in different ways, depending on their access to technology. And so kind of going off of this and these considerations, um, some evidence has been going around and researchers have really been trying to jump on this topic because Obviously, it's a huge concern to people. And so this study by Kuffeld and colleagues um, has been cited a lot as a real warning to the level of um, damage that COVID is going to do for students in classrooms. And so this was conducted over the summer, um, so relatively soon after COVID hit, and the findings were pretty alarming. And so they ran models based on previous student data to project where students would be given COVID not happening at all. And then given COVID based on absences, absences models and then summer loss models. And so as you can tell from these projections here, that solid line is that normal trajectory where students might lose a little over the summer, but not too bad. And then the dotted lines are the projections based on different sorts of um, ways of looking at it. And at worst, they predicted that students could be losing up to 50% of what they had learned in the previous year. So we kind of bring this to your attention because it's a, it's a good summary of some of the data that's been going out and the ways that we're looking at COVID impacts. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really scary, it's really dire. And a lot of these uh, really big dire warnings about the disastrous impact of COVID have been going around. Um, so really before we get into what we've done and what we've seen in our research, we wanted to give you a chance to sort of talk about what information or what's happening or what circumstances you've seen in your schools. And uh, Dr. Bergman's gonna set up that discussion for you. He will as soon as he gets himself out of the chat. Uh, and uh, so thank you all for uh, throwing that information uh, into the chat. 
Um, thanks, Austin, for providing all that information. Uh, sounds like some of that uh, information was resonating with, with some of you and those kind of things. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to send you off into the chat rooms, or sorry, the breakout rooms. Uh, we're going to do so for uh, about five minutes uh, in groups of, it looks, three to four. Um, and so I uh, just want you to give you an opportunity just to share uh, what kind of academic impact you guys are seeing due to COVID uh, and some of the things that you're seeing and then giving an opportunity to come back and report out. Uh, so I'm going to hit the magic button and send you all to breakout rooms. Again, about five minutes, just share a couple of things that you all are seeing, uh, some of the uh, issues you guys are facing, um, potentially exchange some networking and contact information. We'll bring you back, we'll do a share out, and then we'll talk about some of the remediation strategies and some of the data that we're doing. So welcome back. Hope you guys had a nice uh, opportunity to chat. Um, either in the chat uh, feet function there at the bottom or just uh, unmute yourself and, and throw some stuff out there. Uh, will you also raise your hand so we could uh, call on you and all that kind of stuff? Um, yeah, uh, and we'll, there will be an opportunity to share some contact info uh, later in the session because we want to make sure this is an opportunity to network and then also be Q&A. So does anybody want to share what they discussed either in the chat or uh, throw it out there and, and give an opportunity to, to, to speak and and, uh, and, and discuss uh, what you all had talked about, some of the common uh, things that you all saw or anything else? I'll go. In our group, we saw um, attendance, focus, um, and the motivation as a common theme. Um, a lot of the kids being left home because parents are working, so they're on their own to get into class, stay into class, and stay focused while they're in class. The level of distractions that they face, um, just getting their assignments done or even staying focused. I know for me, a lot of my kids said just looking at a computer screen for five hours a day is just too much for them. They just tap out. They, but so, you know, they just are going. So that was some of the common themes that we talked about, just the motivation level and keeping them engaged while they're in class. Yeah, it is funny how you had never thought about, you know, getting them away from all of the other possible distractions is uh, a, a way to help keep them focused. And so that's really good. Uh, so yeah, Jenny, yeah, and the uh, and and Sophia, yes, the uh, the Zoom fatigue is real uh, when you're staring at a computer screen uh, and looking at all the time. That's outstanding. Uh, other folks uh, would like to care to share uh, and, and throw out what you all discussed and talked about. Um, in our group, and I want to speak to Miss O. I know exactly who that was. I was just speaking to us. We work in the same building. <laughs> Uh, we're just on different ends, but um, in our group, uh, Cecilia and Michelle and I spoke on um, with our kids with the, uh, the attendance piece, just getting them to show up. That's been a problem for us. And then um, the, the issues with Wi-Fi, you know, a lot of places are crashing. You know, some kids have the hot spots and the, just the whole technology piece has become an issue for us. Yeah, the uh, and that that is that's a, a really big challenge uh, that that uh, we even see at the college, uh, and and we're we're we work to try to find remediation strategies for that. But yeah, that's a very very uh, tough part. I think that goes a little bit with Katrina's part about some of that digital divide. Uh, not only do you have access, your comfort with the access uh, and all that kind of information. So uh, yeah, so uh, Tiffany, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, and yeah, keep the comments and chats going. Let's get one or two more share outs and then we'll, we'll jump into some of the remediation strategies that are out there that we've done in the literature. So uh, yeah, time management skills. Yeah, we're starting to see a little bit more of that, Jody, uh, uh, about that um, uh, at the, the college level as well, where they're uh, because, and it, you know, it's interesting. Um, and, and it's for the students as well. And, and one of the things you'll see here in the, the next part is talking about the social emotional learning piece and uh, you know, somewhat sometimes I think that seems to be kind of a fad uh, to talk about social emotional learning. But what we do know from the cognitive science and, and the research and the literature that's starting to come out more and more is, it's not so much that we need to focus on the social emotional learning elements of it. It's that those social elements, those emotional elements that the students are not getting by physically interacting with their peers. It's the way you blow off steam and you refocus your, your, your brain in order to then consume the, the information in the classroom. Uh, and so some of that is just really like a, a pressure valve that is just not getting an opportunity to get released. Um, and so that is also a really, really important piece. And it's really, really stinking hard to replicate that uh, online. I know at Austin and, and Mitch had mentioned, we, we teach a couple undergrad classes and we try our best to replicate that. Um, but man, when Austin gave them an opportunity to come back, social distance in mask, uh, they flocked to it immediately simply because they haven't got an opportunity to do that. 
Perfect. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Uh, yep. Agreed. So on, I'll, I'll share. Wait. Um, and I'm sorry, I have two screens, so I'm kind of looking at you guys, and my camera's a little off. I'm sorry, but don't I, I, I don't remember um, my partner, but she was a board member, and she shared something that um, I guess was another aspect that I think is powerful to to share with the with the group. But she discussed how um, the uh, students, the black and brown students, were having more academic success being at home. I guess in a different uh, level of comfort or where they had the representation and how those students were doing um, better on their NWA map testing than they would have done if they were in person. And then the students who were um, non-colored were starting to have a regression and those parents were the ones who really want their students to come back versus the students who are black and brown in this particular district um, were thriving from their home and not um, you know, so so for me, I've never even thought about that aspect. So that's there's a lot of things to unpack with that. But just to see that the students were able to have some success at home, and then as a district, what do you do, and how do you transition that back to the school setting so that those students who are black and brown can feel that representation and and have a sense of belonging and able to have that academic success when they're back in the school environment. But I thought that was very interesting and um, a different aspect to the academic impact of COVID. Yeah, extraordinarily interesting uh, and not anything I had ever thought about either. Uh, we often, uh, um, you know, are concerned about, uh, we, I guess you hear stories about a lot of the uh, uh, digital divide, the, the accessibility uh, uh, piece uh, being unfortunately along of uh, skin color. And so, uh, but to, to see that there's some, I think there's going to be some things that we take from COVID moving forward that uh, is gonna help us uh, kind of level the playing field, although we got some work to do. So that's really, really great. Thank you all for the sharing. Um, we're gonna jump into some of our results and talk to you a little bit about some of the remediation strategies so we can share that information out, but we're definitely gonna make sure that we leave time uh, for questions. And we're also gonna make sure we leave time for exchanging contact information uh, if, if we would like to keep a group of folks together who are interested in what we're doing. So if you'd like to go to the next slide, Austin. Um, so these are identifying and closing some of the gap uh, pieces and a little bit about some of the remediation strategies. Um, so if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide there. Um, so, uh, you know, we have started to talk a little bit about the learning impact and we're still really getting our head wrapped around uh, the learning impact and what that is going to look like. Uh, the projections uh, that we saw, some of the, the hypotheses that we had, as Austin had already talked about and reviewed, versus the reality of some of the data that we're seeing and, and what it really means to uh, have what the, the learning loss, if you will, or the COVID impact on learning is going to happen. Uh, and I know always assessing learning is a very challenging endeavor. Um, and so we got a lot of work ahead of us there. But we're also starting to switch and start to think a, bit, a little bit about remediation planning and what that's going to look like. And that's just trying to offer the support to the students to catch up on the learning uh, through a variety of different means. And again, taking into account their well-being and their social emotional needs uh, and, and, and is a part of that process. And so one of the things that we've talked about a little bit is envisioning and understanding, uh, deciding what we want to do after we kind of understand the scope of the problem, uh, deciding and designing some sets of interventions, obviously enabling and executing those when the logistics of who gets done, who, who gets uh, help, the extra support, how much do they get, and then all the, the, the financial implications for some of that as well. And then it's not just set it and forget it and then one and done. We need to continue to monitor to make sure that we are examining some of the long-term uh, impacts of this and doing our best to kind of catch this up. So when we talk about the remediation planning, that's kind of the big steps of this. Uh, we're still very much in that first and second parts, um, but uh, our plan is to start moving very quickly into the, uh, the third and the fourth parts uh, starting next year with some of the, the gear up schools that we're working with. So Austin, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Uh, some of this is we need to make sure that we have alignment of our remediation strategies. Uh, and so there are some uh, additional resources that we have here. Um, the uh, McKinsey organization has thrown out uh, some, some different pieces to take a look at. And they came up with this kind of two by two grid that I thought was a very interesting way to kind of look at overall in your organization, in your county. Uh, they were also doing it by country. Uh, what kinds of, of learning loss can you have? And basically what they were doing is talking about the extent to which individuals are, students are getting uh, behind in their learning. Do you have a, a little bit of loss or do you have a lot of loss? And the distribution 
of that uh, of that loss. So do you have uh, some a, a little bit of loss with a lot of your students? Do you have a lot of loss with a lot of students? And kind of thinking about the different mixing and matching that you would need to do as far as the additional support areas. And indeed, what we I think are going to find is some students are not that far behind or maybe ahead or right on track. And there's not a whole lot of additional support that they need. And so understanding not only the depth uh, of the, uh, the, the intervention, uh, the loss that your students have, but how widespread is that? And thinking about that distribution of it are two good dimensions to kind of think about. And that's very much where we are when we're digging into the data and conducting the analyses. And then we move to our remediation slide. Next slide, Austin, if you wouldn't mind. And that's really talking a little bit about what we can do for remediation. And so Advance Illinois, uh, we've been in conversations, chatting with them about providing some of those resources, and then some of these resources and some information that we've looked up and found. But generally speaking, the remediation strategies are bucketing into four different buckets, if you will. Uh, delivering more time to the students that need it, whether that is uh, weekend schooling, whether that's extended days, whether that's summer school. Um, I like they call it, they had vacation academies. Uh, and that was simply where you go really intensive on one particular subject for seven days, 10 days, or something like that. Uh, and then re-enrollment, um, that should be re-enrollment, sorry, if we needed to, students who have dropped out of, uh, of the, the particular, or we've lost track of them, we have not seen them attend, how do we get them re-engaged and re-enrolling into that, uh, in, back into the educational pipeline? And then we talk a little bit about dedicated attention. Do we do peer-to-peer -peer learning? Do we do breakout groups? Do we do individual tutoring? Also maybe talking a little bit about compressed content uh, and reducing or revising the curriculum and the, and the information that you teach them of kind of whittling it down to the basics and being able to get them to the absolute critical skills they need to succeed at the next grade level and, and starting to maybe slim down some of those pieces of information to help move them through there. And then I thought this was the last one was an interesting uh, remediation uh, possibility. So what they were calling looping and uh, primarily uh, in the uh, elementary school was, you know, you've got that process of having to get to know your students every year. Uh, and so what they were suggesting is just have the same teacher follow those students to the next grade level. So all of those social connections are already built and you don't have to uh, spend and invest quite as much time on that really, really important element of the student teacher relationship. And you can get to more of the academic information fairly fast. And so those are some of the strategies um, with delivery. You know, it's bringing in extra uh, teachers, uh, tutors, P TAs. One thing I thought was interesting that they were talking about um, most school administrators used to be teachers at one time. And so leveraging some of that school administration time uh, during this next year to help catch up uh, as some additional support, because I know it's always easier to say, hire new teachers, hire new tutors, hire new TAs, but uh, the funding is often a problem about that. Um, uh, and then um, I think we had a really, really great point about some of the technology pieces uh, and that online learning can be effective if you do it well, do it right, and under the same uh, the right situations. So that's where understanding where your students are and what they need, you can help deliver some of that. And then some of the uh, things we've seen this with a couple of our rural schools that we're working with Gear Up uh, in Illinois is the online piece is just not working, but actually they had very good luck with paper and pencil, postal mail types of fill in your homework, mail it back run it by the school, drop it off. And so that has actually been a lot more successful than some of the distractions for online. And so kind of that old school throwback technology is still something that's possible uh, and that's in play. And so these are some of the remediation strategies that are out there. I just wanted to stop and just, you know, in the chat, throw in some of the things that you all are considering uh, about maybe what you were done, uh, what you guys have thought about doing. Um, and, uh, and, and kind of uh, provide that uh, kind of feedback and, and provide engagement while Austin shows you a couple of our preliminary pieces of information and how we're going to go through this process of examining and identifying what types of students we have, where their losses are, and then working really hard to match each of those students up with the proper remediation strategy. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, that's a great um, kind of introduction and really focus on what we're trying to do is matching those students with the possible remediation strategy that's going to be best for them. And um, particularly, I know Katrina and Kimberly shared in the chat and uh, out loud that some students might actually be benefiting from some of these changes. And so really trying to get through the data and see what students are doing fine and what students are really struggling. And that way we can better kind of implement strategies to really help them out and keep them on track. 
And so our study involves um, gear up school in Illinois grades K through 12. And we have all sorts of data. So we have quarterly GPA absence totals by month. And we're really focusing on these standardized testing. So we have map growth assessments focused on math and reading that we do have science in some grades. And then looking at the demographic information, race, ethnicity, student gender, low income, homelessness, and trying to figure out what specific individual factors or group factors that we can identify that are going to be different across students where we can really focus our um, efforts to really remediate or help them or do whatever we need to make sure all the students are succeeding. And so I wanted to kind of preface this um, by saying we only got updated data from the 2020 to 2021 school year on Friday. So we have not had a ton of time to really go through everything and really um, craft like a bunch of nice, neat um, graphs for you. But here's um, a summary of our pre preliminary data. And so here we have median MAP scores comparing 2019 to 2020 in the winter and 2020 to 2021 in the winter, which we got these, they were taken at the end of January. And so as you can see, kind of per grade, obviously there's an upward trend due to how these MAP uh, scores are really reported. They're all on the same scale so that you can compare them and see that growth over time or across grades. Um, but the, the important thing here is uh, comparing that dark blue bar and that orange bar. So dark blue is 2019 to 2020 in the winter. And then the orange is the 2020, 2021 winter scores. And as you can see, there's the trend where that orange bar is slightly, slightly below that uh, mark of the blue bar from last year. But it's not too much lower. And so kind of thinking about this in context, we were, we talked about how some of the literature earlier, some of the research has really been very scary about how big these losses could be. And so far, again, this is just our preliminary data, so we can't really jump to any conclusions, but these trends seem to be that students may not be doing quite as well as they have before, but it's not all that bad. And so kind of taking a deeper look into this, we said maybe overall there it's, it's not that bad. So then we divided it into um, math tests and reading tests. So the top is math. It's the same data comparing 2019, 2020 to 2020 to 21. And as you can see, these graphs are pretty close to similar. Again, the uh, scores from this year are slightly below where they were last year. But again, they follow the same kind of trend. And so that's indicating that there's not too much of a difference in uh, math versus reading in terms of that, of that COVID effect. So then we decided maybe we should kind of take a little bit of a deeper look and try to see maybe there are differences between student gender. And so this is where we got a little bit more um, kind of interesting results. This graph is of ninth to 11th graders. So we kind of shrunk the sample a little bit and just focused on some of those high school students. And this has their test last year and this year in each of those subjects. So math is on the left, reading is on the right, and then comparing male students and female students. And so starting on the left in this, in, in math, you can see both dropped overall from last year to this year, but the drop, the drop for females was a little bit steeper. So the median dropped by six points, whereas in males, it only dropped two and a, uh, two thirds points. And then kind of looking at reading, it's a little bit different story where in males, the median score actually rose from last year to this year, whereas the female median also dropped. And so these are some sort of interesting results um, that we didn't, didn't expect too much, um, especially in reading, it, it kind of the literature suggests that especially female students do a better job of kind of reading on their own or reading at home over the summer. And so these effects especially were kind of interesting to us and maybe a little bit cause for concern or maybe really indicative of things that we can do to really help out those students. But again, we want to reiterate that this is just our preliminary data. We're going to use all of the data that we've got to really kind of forecast and compare where the students were using their previous data to kind of project where they would have been without COVID and then use the data that we've really just gotten to try to tease out those differences um, in individual difference data. 
this is not national data. This is just data from um, one of the gear up schools in Illinois. And so right now the sample size is fairly small in that we only have a few grades, but as we kind of put all the data together, again, we just got it Friday. We're gonna be able to kind of put more information out there and be able to tease those differences apart, especially in individual difference categories. And I see in the chat also um, vulnerable groups like low income and students of color. We have that data, but we haven't had a chance to really go through it yet. And so we're going to move towards that direction and hopefully um, you can kind of connect to us and we can share that data with you as we continue through our research project. And one of the problems with the national database is that we've seen it, well, not problems, but it's, it's, it's the same, you know, that, that a lot of the student level specific data is not uh, captured in that. And so you're looking at aggregations. Um, and so even that Annenberg study, uh, part of the thing that they were saying is we need to look at some of the specific student level characteristics um, and background and some of the other information that's not contained uh, in the, uh, the national files. And so that's where we've, um, that's where we've had uh, a, uh, an opportunity uh, to, to work specifically uh, with these schools uh, to give them customized uh, solutions for their specific students, um, which we're very, very excited about. Um, I'm really, complete side note, I'm really excited because it, it's uh, this uh, random coefficients modeling project that is this cool multi-level data thing. So it's really, really statistically awesome, but the practical implications are even more awesome. Um, and so we're, we're still filtering through that. Uh, also, uh, uh, sorry, a couple other folks had some questions in there. Um, a lot of this data is just really, really new because so many of the 2020, 2021 tests uh, and information has been uh, pushed back. Uh, and so uh, I, you see in a lot of folks uh, uh, sizing what should happen or could happen based on historical data. Uh, but this is some of the first stuff that we've seen and we've been scouring pretty intensely of uh, folks that are sharing results from this year. Um, that will start to slowly come out as, you, as we've just noted, uh, schools are just now getting those and they're reporting it up. So it's, there's gonna be a little bit of a lag. And in particular with this data, we're going to be able to kind of track the same students from their previous years. Whereas if you sort of use just national data, it's harder to kind of tease out what specific students are doing in what areas because it is so aggregated. And so that's what we're really excited about is having those individual students and tracking them over the time and being able to see that COVID impact on them. I got your phone. Daryl is throwing some great questions out there. Uh, I don't know, Austin, do you know about the, um, um, was this remote or in person? Was this school, I think they went back in person, but I don't know how they this, collected this information. And that's why we also need to include some of that information that's in sort of the absence data that we have where for the most part it was remote, but some of it was um, in hybrid and some of it they've shifted back into person. And so that's why when we get all of that data together, kind of merge that absence information, that mode of learning, and then we can really try to see those individual, individual differences uh, much better than sort of viewing it on the aggregate. So keep those questions going. Uh, oh, sorry, Austin, this one's you. No, keep moving forward. But yeah, just kind of generally talking about how we can use this. We really want to encourage you and it seems like you're all very excited about this with all the questions of try to find your own data or use your own data or look at the data to make sure that you can really identify the current levels in your students. Some of you have shared that maybe some groups of your students are actually doing better where some may be doing worse. It might depend a lot on the individual characteristics of your school, of your classes. And so trying to identify level of students is going to help you be able to craft your policies, craft your remediation strategies to make sure students are behind, are caught up, and students who are still doing fine stay like that, especially maybe if they're doing well on online, if they're coming back in person. Again, like Kimberly had brought up, making sure that they're staying at that high level achievement that they have had recently. The second thing is to really try to keep online um, learning more engaging. Um, online learning is probably going to be here for a little bit longer. And so just trying to do everything you can to make sure that's as effective as possible. I know that um, I think earlier this morning, there was a session on making sure uh, or how to create engaging online curriculums. Also, there's another session tomorrow about ways that schools are really crafting solutions um, to the COVID problem. 
And so just trying to think through that and making sure that online learning is engaging. And then as we move forward, trying to make that transition back to in-person learning as smooth as possible. Obviously there are tons of different concerns. There's still the health concerns. There's still the logistical concerns of trying to get everybody back in class, but really trying to make sure that you've thought through the evidence and thought through how you're plan making this plan to make students back in class and so that the focus stays on the student learning and hopefully we can uh, see better academic achievement as a result of these. All right, so uh, in our wrap up session here, uh, we just had a couple of, of questions. Um, and so I uh, just curious as to uh, what data results or anything you all have examined to identify whose learning is being most impacted. Again, trying to go to that depth versus dispersion of the learning impact. Have you all had a, an opportunity to take a look at any data? Um, and see any results. Uh, again, we just got ours on Friday, uh, working uh, closely with our partner school. Uh, and so uh, that, um, you know, learning strategies that you all are investigating. Um, and of course, we are, we are working through part of the evidence-based practices framework um, is you, uh, you pick the interventions that are the most relevant and the most trusted. Uh, and a lot of that is a, a process we go through to vet uh, those particular uh, interventions. However, a lot of them uh, don't have a lot of data behind them. Uh, and so we're having to some, you know, uh, uh, best available data is, or best available evidence is what evidence-based practice is all about. And sometimes that's best practices. Uh, sometimes it's data, sometimes it's a, a thorough vetting, but other times it's not. Um, and then if, would you mind, uh, go to the last one then too, uh, uh, Austin. A couple things to throw into the chat uh, window and please keep the questions coming. We got about six minutes uh, to go. Any other questions you have? Um, and then one interesting thing that you learned in the session, I think that would be great. And if you uh, would like to be involved in a conversation and a discussion about uh, the COVID learning impact, um, throw your contact information in the chat. We will save out that information and we will follow up via email and uh, maybe look to get a, a group together. Again, part of what we want to do, part of what you don't get an opportunity to do uh, that we miss in the in-person um, conferences is all of the uh, networking connections you make uh, in between sessions um, at the buffet line, uh, getting coffee in the morning. And so we wanna make sure this is an opportunity to do that. So if you'd like to just uh, throw your email address in the, uh, the chat, we're gonna save those out and we'll follow up with an email just to say, hey, uh, yes, we'd love to, to continue the conversation. Um, and it really would just be a group of folks maybe getting together to talk about what they have seen and what has been working for them. Um, but we're also happy to share our lessons that we've learned and that kind of stuff. So um, if you wouldn't mind doing that, great. And then while you're throwing those in there, uh, let's, uh, you know, somebody jump on, ask one last question, one last uh, cool thing that you learned, uh, something that you, uh, you think we could do. Oh, hi, Emily. I missed you. I did not see you in the thing previously. So hi. Um, so anybody else uh, have anything else they'd like to share or contact information? Uh, please, please, please throw that in the chat or uh, unmute yourself and, and throw it out. Well, Sam, I will let you reach into your uh, bowling bag and uh, come up with a, uh, a, a way to close us out. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to uh, thank Sean and Austin both. And since otherwise, I want to thank everybody for uh, participating today. And again, a special thanks for Sean and Austin, um, not just for today, but what you're doing every day for our Illinois students through Gear Up and the 60 by 25 network. Thank Great. you.